Okay, um, now before we start, I um, always like to know this with the Gresham audience, you're never quite sure who you're dealing with. Do we have any bishops in the audience today? Now don't be shy, no bishops. Ministers of religion, come on, I've been speaking to you all downstairs. No, no, not too many. Any vergers, sacristans, church wardens? No, is there anyone here from the tablet or the church times? No, it looks like we've got a clear run today then, splendid. <laughs> now, um... <laughs> No, 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 I think the vote would be unanimous. Um, now, there's been a quite remarkable response this year to the 400th anniversary of the publication of the King James Bible, which, as we shall hear, um, had quite a sort of bumpy start, and the um, period proceeding was even bumpier, and in many ways the King James at the time was controversial, and to some extent um, remains so. But our topic today... Um, rather more than theological, is the language. Um, David Crystal, a um, great writer on the English language, has identified no fewer than 257 phrases that have passed into common use from their location in the King James. Um, let there be light, faith, hope and charity, and such everyday terms as by the skin of one's teeth, fly in the ointment, no peace for the wicked, let alone, let alone be afraid, be horribly afraid which does not come from St. Arnold Schwarzenegger, as you might believe, but actually is Jeremiah. So the whole process of the translation of the Bible into English takes place over a longish period of time, and we have to say it has its roots in the works of John Wycliffe and William Tyndale, not to mention Miles Coverdale and um, various uh, assorted um, assistants in the process. But it's the King James which somehow finally wins the day as the definitive translation in English, as well it might, given the companies which were set up in Oxford, Cambridge and Westminster, comprising the most eminent men in the land, who were not only fluent in Hebrew, Greek and Latin, but who also polish off the lesser known, but no less critical languages, such as Syriac, Arabic and Aramaic. Now, the need to get back to the original texts and review their meaning developed with the growth of our knowledge of ancient Greek, uh, a key feature of the Renaissance. John Collett, who is uh, Dean of St Paul's, and I have to say a mercy himself, um, put himself at some personal risk. Uh, he actually translated the Greek tes Testament into English, and as he went along, he had meetings at St Paul's Cross. There's still a cross in the churchyard of St Paul's, big meeting place uh, in the early 16th century, and he would read his translation aloud. And he actually put himself at some risk of being burnt at the stake for doing so. But he was so eminent they couldn't touch him. And um, no less a person than Erasmus of Rotterdam, again look downstairs, you'll see a version of this, who was a great friend of Colette and a great friend of Sir Thomas More, who by sheer coincidence was a mercer, he also produced his own version, very, very important because the reading of critical Bible texts in one language don't coincide with the official Vulgate version. And this is as bad as Darwin saying we can't believe the literal version of Genesis. It raises the question as to whether the Vulgate of St. Jerome, whose Saints' Day incidentally is on Friday, um, was actually correct in what had been written down. Were there misreadings? In later editions were there um, typos and the kind of things which always creep in. So very, very important. And of course the wider understanding of Hebrew. And I always put a plug in here for the School of Translators of Toledo. Not a school in the school sense, but in the school of, you know, Florentine school. Jews, Arabs and Christians settled amicably in the city of Toledo and we really ought to look to see how they did it because over several hundred years, it's a fantastic place if you go and visit it. You've got mosques, you've got synagogues, you've got churches. Most of them, of course, were converted into churches and some are being converted back again. But here you get the learning from the East, the lost Greek learning, Arabic science, coming back into Europe through the translations into Toledo. And being the European day of languages, of course, I have to put in a plug for the translators, being one myself. Now, um, this also coincides, of course, with the invention of printing. Gutenberg has a lot to answer for. Um, as big as the internet today, if not bigger. It changes the course of European history. Um, now, um, this not only increases the demand for religious tracts, but also Bibles, the great Gutenberg Bible, of course, and the need for the Bible in the vernacular. Now, I'd like to show you two texts, if I can press the right button. There we are. 
Um, now, two texts in Latin. Now, they are both sacred texts in their own way. So I would like you to join with me at the end in saying Amen, if you would. In principio erat verbum, et verbum erat apud Deum, et Deus erat verbum, hoc erat in principio apud Deum, omnia per ipsum facta sunt, et sine ipsum factum est nihil, quod factum est. In ipso vita erat, et vita erat lux hominum, et lux in tenebris lucet, et tenebrae eam non comprehenderont. Everybody? Thank you. The second text. Ecce usus scales occipite gradus pulsante post descendens, est quod sciat unus et solus modus gradibus descendendi, non unquam autum sentit, etiam altera modum extare dum modo pulsationibus decinori, third conjugation, not decinari, et de eum modo meditare posit. De ende cens et alios modus non esse, en nunc imse imo est vobis ostentari poratus, nomen audiens primum sicut vos dicturi estis. Etiam, ego dixi. Everybody, please. The first one, quite rightly, was, of course, um, the beginning of St. John and at the core of the Christian faith. And, of course, in church you would normally be asked to stand up for it. The second text, equally sacred in its own way, you will know it off by heart, is normally read lying down. Because, of course, it's bedtime reading. I have just got all of you to say Amen to Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> I think the case for translating the Bible into English is proven. Now, um, let's get on to page three. It's all good stuff, this. Now, this was far from the case in the 16th century. Translating the Bible into English was no laughing matter. Um, Wycliffe's bones were dug up and burnt 40 years after his death. Tyndall was burnt at the stake only a few years before the great Bible was placed in every English parish church and as you will see downstairs after the first Bible in English had been produced. But having the Bible only in Latin was noted as far back as King Alfred the Great who realised the shortage of priests in the Kingdom of Wessex who understood Latin. And his response, good linguist was Alfred, was to set up a translation school in Winchester. Now, it has to be said, when the King James Bible first appeared in 1611, it was far from perfect. Demand was so strong that printers worked in teams to produce folios which were then bound together, sometimes, of course, in the wrong order. And there were some notorious misprints, of which the best known is the Wicked Bible, where the word not is left out of the seventh commandment, which, of course, makes adultery compulsory. <laughs> the other error which cheers up everybody at the Stationers' Company, who are part of this story, they were heavily involved in the original production, comes in Psalm 119, um, which reads, Printers have persecuted me without cause. <laughs> and it should, of course, read, Princes have persecuted me without cause. Then we have the parable of the vinegar, which, of course, might be the parable of the vineyard, but there could be an unknown parable, you never know. And the other problem is the use of language, which, however sacred, is also archaic. And this becomes a major issue. The King James Bible had the ring of earlier times to it, quite deliberately. About 80% of it comes from Tyndall's efforts, and a lot of that is drawn, in fact, from Wycliffe, which takes us back to the 14th century. So the problem is going to be even more acute 400 years later. Now, I well remember my daughter at the age of seven coming back from Sunday school, very proud because she'd learnt the Lord's Prayer. And she said, Daddy... You know, give us this day our daily bread. I said, yes. She said, is this why we call God Jehovah's? <laughs> You've heard of the Jehovah's Witnesses? So there we are. Now, worse or quite possibly better came from a little friend who solemnly assured me that she knew God's first name. And I thought I'd better found out so I could pass it on to the Pope next time I see him. And I said, yes, Jessica, what's, what's the Pope's... Oh, sorry, what's, the, what's God's first name? She said, it's Harold. Harold? Yes, it's in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, someone more versed in theology uh, than me once said, out of the mouths of babes and infants. Quite possibly suffer little children, and those of us who've had them at home know quite what the, look, what the good Lord was saying. Now, um, there is a problem, and this is something which we will be discussing today. The tone and the style of the King James is slightly archaic, but the translators say in the preface, we desire that the scripture may speak like itself, as in the language of Canaan, that it may be understood even of the very vulgar, 
which in turn echoes Tyndall's point about the boy who drives a plough. So it's perhaps for this reason, being a member of the stationer's company, I can't come to the Mercers and not give us a very reasonable rates for dinners, folks. Um, <laughs> now, the translators' companies actually met at Stationers Hall, not this splendid venue which I'm showing you today, but Abigail Venue Hall, which got burnt down in the Great Fire. Um, they read it aloud to each other, not only to check for accuracy, but it was a Bible to be read aloud. And a lot of the verses, in fact, are perfect iambic pentameters. Though I myself don't subscribe to the legend, which we will see enshrined downstairs, that Shakespeare himself contributed to Psalm 46. But the text overall has a resonance which gives it power to this day, in everywhere, I think, from school assembly to the local parish church. Now, I was put in mind of this a few years ago. I was going into hospital for a small operation, and the text at church that Sunday was, Take up thy bed and walk. Um, John 5, verse 8, as it springs to mind. And I took this to be a good omen, you see. But I notice in the New Revised Standard Version of 1989 that it gives you, pick up your stretcher and go off home. (laughs) Now, if anyone were to loom over me and say, take up thy bed and walk, believe me, I would. But if anyone were to say, go on, pick up your stretcher and go off home, I would probably say, oh, right, if you say so. In fact, it sounds better in a a Yorkshire accent. It sounds like Sam, Sam, pick up thy musket. So it just doesn't have the impact. Does it sound like the good Lord saying to the man who'd been paralysed for 38 years, get up, you can do it. Pick up your stretcher and go, go off home. It sounds like the St John's Ambulance Brigade. So <laughs> there we are, for whom I have great respect. So there are a lot of phrases which people know instinctively. Um, and people, of course, are slow to accept change. We've seen this in recent years. The Anglican rendition of the Lord's Prayer, which I have to say I still don't know by heart, and the controversy arising from the new translation of the Roman Missal. If you go onto the tablet website and read their blog, um, there are all sorts of views about um, what are really, I think, quite minor changes to the text. But it is something which people tend to feel very strongly about. Now, the King James Bible, to some extent, spawns other enterprises, and this is why I think the language has been as strong as it has, because we come across it in so many different places. And I'd just like to touch on Pilgrim's Progress and Hymns Ancient and Modern. Um, John Bunyan, there we are, Pilgrim's Progress, 1678. Um, Some phrases come into the language, the slough of despond and the celestial city, and, of course, um, biblical quotations, the valley of the shadow of death, comes across very clearly, let alone that bit about hobgoblins and foul fiends in verse 4 of He Who Would True Valor See, which we always used to like at school. I had a great thing about hobgoblins. Um, and the impact of favourite hymns drawn from the King James text should not be underestimated as a way of keeping particular lines in the popular mind. Um, Psalm 23, The Lord's My Shepherd, springs to mind. Um, but of the other books in the Bible, um, John actually wins by a short head over Luke in terms of the number of verses which contribute to the hymn writers. And St John has given us, O come all ye faithful, guide me, O thy great redeemer, the king of love my shepherd is, and rock of ages. That's a pretty good spread, isn't it? Um, And I often wonder how many of the memorable words and phrases which were identified by David Crystal have actually passed into the popular language via well-known hymns rather than the reading of the Bible itself.